Hey there. If you are just tuning in, start back at the beginning. Everything will make a lot more sense if you do. Previously on Shots in the Back. They said, put out a shoot to kill an order over the radio. Well, they, they were just ready to shoot. They were ready to go. It's like rabbit hunting, you know, like deer hunting. They were ready to shoot. Just like when somebody turned off a light switch. I could see him every day, and every night. Sometimes I wish it was me instead of him. And the whole time I'm wondering, was this worth it? From Jesse Norman School of the Arts and Georgia Public Broadcasting, this is Shots in the Back. I'm C. Stachura. In this episode, we look at the immediate aftermath of the riot. Was there justice for Charles Oatman's family? Or for the families of the men who were killed in the riot? What happened to the police officers who were involved? And how did the public respond? On May 13, 1970, one day after the riot, 16-year-old Charles Oatman was laid to rest. His funeral was held at True Vine Missionary Baptist Church. Friends and family lined the walls. I tried not, but I can't help the Lord. At Charles's funeral, Pastor R.V. Sims said, quote, God, give us the courage to face these cruel days we are now facing. In the archival footage, you can see women in white dresses fanning themselves with programs. A news camera was stationed behind Charles's bronze casket. You can't see his face in the footage, just the white satin inlay of the casket. And at the feet of the coffin is a massive heart made of red and white flowers. True Vine Church still holds Sunday services in the very same brick building. I wanted to see it, to remind myself that what happened in Augusta 50 years ago hasn't entirely disappeared. I drove my student Tierra Duggar there. You know how I said that um, Charles Oatman's funeral took place right over there? Yeah, because we already passed it, so we'll go back just a little bit. Mercer is is the cross street. My, I think my great-grandmother also had her funeral there. Yeah, they were here for a long time. True Vine is on a busy street. Only three lanes, but... Lots of cars and trucks pass through on their way to downtown. The neighborhoods behind it are full of bungalows. They're owned and rented by black families and seniors. And Kitty Corner across the street would have been the worst Hernland department store. We're just past this spot, like right, this little dot right here. That's where Charles Mac Murphy died. And he would have died, like, right right near that. I just think that's in, it's... Next to the church? So. Yeah. Yeah, cause that's true. So it was, it was like in this area at the funeral home. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. The afternoon of Charles's funeral, the streets would have smelled like smoke and gunpowder. Families would have been bailing their loved ones out of jail. Roughly 300 black people were arrested during the riot. The streets of their neighborhoods were under lockdown by the National Guard. The first 500 troops wouldn't leave for another three days. Even True Vine Missionary Baptist was surrounded by them. They were stationed outside, in part, because whites were afraid black anger would swell and turn violent again. But 
Blacks were also afraid that white vigilantes would firebomb the church. Some white residents had been deputized following the riot. Roy Harris says white Augustans armed themselves for war. Harris was a staunch segregationist, and he was the former speaker of the Georgia House of Representatives. I never saw if people buy as many guns in my life. I'm 74 years old and never owned a pistol. Never thought of the necessity of having one. But I got one now, and I take it in my car wherever I go. Harris was interviewed in 1970 for a documentary series called Realities. It was produced by National Educational Television. The leaders amongst the black population and the whites have been bragging about the fine race relations that have existed in this town. And uh, they've been bragging all the time, all those years. And nobody, but I tell you, the relations aren't good now. Many white people in Augusta were afraid black people were coming to get them. Fred McBrayer remembers his neighbor went door to door distributing ammunition the night of the riot. McBrayer is the former high school rehabilitation counselor who worked with Charles Oatman. He's white, and at the time of the riot, he lived in a working-class neighborhood. He remembers realtors preying on white people's fears. Every doorstep in our neighborhood had a pamphlet put on it saying that they were willing to buy our home. And I'm sure they were going to give pennies on the dollar. The implication was that blacks would destroy their neighborhoods in another riot or move in. So white residents should move out before either of those things happened. If a buyer agreed to sell, the realtor could buy the house cheap. Then they'd mark up the price for a black family. Many whites moved out to Augusta's neighboring county. It was farmland until the civil rights era. After the 1970 rebellion, the county's population jumped 6% in one decade. Augusta's outlying areas also saw a spike in housing. Richmond County Commission Chair Matthew Mulherin tried right away to minimize the appearance of any risk. He emphasized the soul-searching opportunity that this provided in an interview with WSB-TV. Well, I think we have to, one, uh, sit down and analyze ourselves and the, uh, the present leadership. I think we have, to, uh, we have to ask for divine guidance in trying to rectify a great amount of this uh, that has happened last night. We have certainly got to change the image. This is a great community, as you know. Mulherin acknowledged white officials may not have been listening to the concerns of younger Black Augustans, and he promised to change that. And certainly we want to establish the uh, line of communication with the new leadership. We have met uh, all morning. Uh, We plan to meet again uh, this afternoon late, and I assume all through the night. From those conversations came a few agreements. The most notable was the creation of the Human Relations Commission. Essentially, this was a task force that would investigate claims of racial discrimination, and we'll get to it later in this episode. But Mulherin's conciliatory tone wasn't echoed by other white leaders. Then-Governor Lester Maddox told reporters that Augusta's uprising was a shame. The rioters and even the young demonstrators at the state capitol had been led astray. I say I don't blame those young people. I don't blame even the National Guard. I blame the, uh, the leaders in our government, the leaders in our su- uh, Supreme Court, who, uh, and uh, leaders in our church and education who have been downplaying God, downplaying America, downplaying the right to private property, downplaying the authority in government. Other white leaders found it hard to even acknowledge that Black Augustans had any reason to rebel. Then Richmond County Sheriff E.R. Atkins was one of them. Well, it seems that there would be something else behind it. Uh, I can't put my finger on it at the moment. Sheriff Atkins and others suggested outsiders came to Augusta to start trouble. But uh, something uh, caused uh, 
this a serious outbreak last night of, uh, of uh, looting and setting places on fire and running around and doing the things that they did. Blacks had repeatedly protested conditions at his jail, but Atkins didn't connect the complaints with the violence. Augusta's mayor, Millard Beckham, blamed the victims when he spoke with the CBS News reporter. The fad since May's violence is for white officials to make ghetto tours. Shortly after the riot, Mayor Millard Beckham made his journey, was shocked at what he saw, said he was going to do something about it. A month later, he was still saying he was going to do something about it. But he saw more fault with blacks than the government. I said I had seen things that were hard for me to believe, and one would have to see it in order to believe it. What is it you don't believe that you saw? That people could allow themselves to live in such filth without actually exerting themselves to some extent to do something about it. But black residents had asserted themselves. Before the riot, they repeatedly spoke out at city council meetings. They told Beckham that their living conditions were untenable. People like Mrs. Connolly from Turpin Hill showed up at city council meetings regularly. She addressed Beckham directly during one of those meetings. Here's an actor reading some of her public remarks. I've been to see you about water and sewage in our area. We have signed petitions and sent. We wrote to Atlanta. We wrote to Washington. At that time, Beckham said the fault was with the federal government. Augusta activists knew they would need to keep up the pressure. One way they did that was with public protests. On May 20th, activists started a 100-mile march against oppression. It honored the lives of the Augusta Six, the six black men shot in the back and killed by police during the riot. An ABC News reporter covered the event. At Perry, Georgia today, some 300 demonstrators, most of them black, began a march through Georgia. The activists walked from Perry, Georgia to Atlanta over the course of five days. Along with the protesters was a mule-driven cart carrying six coffins. The mules were named Nixon for President Richard Nixon and Lester for Georgia Governor Lester Maddox. Their purpose to protest the fatal shootings of students at Jackson State and at Kent State and the death by gunfire of six Negroes in Augusta, Georgia. SCLC leader Hosea Williams was one of the primary organizers. Here he is speaking with ABC News. A major uh, purpose for marching and for this demonstration is to protect the rights that we've already gained. We're not out here trying to make new rights, although we know we're not free. So we're out here saying we do have the right to dissent. We do have the right to freedom of dissent. And we will exercise that right, whether it means jailing or death. But then Governor Lester Maddox urged them not to exercise that right. He insists that they cancel the march. That's John Hayes, a history professor at Augusta University. He's also a member of the 1970 Augusta Riot Observation Committee. He says Maddox refused the SCLC a state patrol escort. And right before they started, he sent them a telegram. And says in the telegram, your actions breed lawlessness, disorder, and injustice, which join in the conspiracy to destroy freedom. He goes even further and says of SCLC. They're doing a disservice to Black people in this country. They're more guilty than anyone else for the six deaths in Augusta. SCLC leader Hosea Williams called Maddox's claims an attempt to suppress Black voices. Two days into the march, Maddox claims that he's now received intelligence that members of the Black Panther Party are part of the march, and that as the march reaches its conclusion at Morehouse College, they will assassinate one of the marchers to create a martyr and make white law enforcement look bad. Hosea Williams shrugs this off. Here's a voice actor reading his response. Only a man like Maddox could have come up with a statement like that. If Maddox himself doesn't send someone out to kill us, none of us will die. 
10,000 more protesters joined the March Against Oppression when it reached Atlanta. And Hosea Williams reminded the crowd why they had carried those six coffins. Here's a portion of his remarks. We have come to mourn the passing of a nation that has gotten so wrapped up in perpetuating itself that it would shoot down six of her proud sons. Augusta activists were also harnessing the public's attention. They registered more voters and kept up pressure on the region's government and its businesses. Less than two weeks after the uprising, the Committee of Ten announced a boycott on certain white-owned businesses. The group was made up of Augusta-area activists. Leon LaRue was the head of the committee. Here's a voice actor reading from his speech. We will boycott each of the stores one by one until either the white owners come down to the Tabernacle Church about improving economic conditions in the black community or until every store on Broad Street is closed down. LaRue said black residents spent $2 million in white-owned businesses. He wanted to see some of those dollars return to the community. At the same time, then-attorney John Ruffin had long been battling Richmond County schools. They had an anemic desegregation effort. After the riot, he pushed harder. He filed an appeal challenging the city's education plan. His civil rights work was significant. Eventually, he became the first black chief judge on the Georgia Court of Appeals. The Richmond County Courthouse was named after him. This, um, the courthouse. Tierra and I drove past the red brick building. So I also remember when this was being built. I was little at the time, like, so it's like a... It's like a fever dream. I can't recall what it looked like before, but I'm pretty sure it was also a plot of grass. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think in like before 1970, it probably was something. And then so much of this downtown area got destroyed that they didn't build anything. They didn't really do anything to rebuild the area. Cause this is like, right on the dividing line between downtown and the black neighborhoods. And yeah, so this, it was the municipal building where they would have had the suit for, um, the lawsuit for um, Charles Oatman, and that would not have existed. I'm talking about the lawsuit that Cornelia Oatman filed against Richmond County officials. Ruffin served as her lawyer, and it asked for $4 million in restitution. Ruffin also served as Cornelia Oatman's lawyer. He filed a lawsuit against county officials on Oatman's behalf in July of 1970, two months after Charles' death. It asked for $4 million in restitution. In the lawsuit, Ruffin alleged that beatings and corporal punishment were widespread at the county jail. This was especially the case amongst Black prisoners— It argued that the sheriff and the jailer encouraged fellow inmates to beat each other. They believed this was also a form of racial discrimination. It seemed at first like Cornelia Oatman's suit might get somewhere. Instead, the court cited her for fraud. Cornelia wasn't Charles's birth mother. Because of that, the court ruled she had no standing to sue. And it ruled she was committing a crime by stating that she was his mother. Biologically, she wasn't. Charles's uncle, Linton Oatman, believes the boy was adopted around two or three years old. He was uh, about three years old when I come home. So he was about that, he was about that tall. And your brother Grover said, where's this kid from? <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> he said he got him out of the chicken coop. Cornelia and Grover Oatman never formally adopted their son. Adoption is an expensive process. It also hadn't been necessary for these families. 
But the U.S. District Court for Southern Georgia ruled that Cornelia had lied about being his parent. In response, Ruffin and Oatman added Charles's birth mother to the suit. But the case stalled out. Eventually, Charles's birth mother received a small settlement. The Oatmans weren't the only ones who endured a miscarriage of justice. And that's ahead on Shots in the Back. This is Shots in the Back. I'm C. Stachura. Welcome back. In this episode, we're focusing on what happened in the days, months, and years after the riot. Now, let's turn to what happened to the Black people who were arrested during that time. What is a jury of one's peers? Let's say that you're a Black woman living in a neighborhood without sewers who was recently fired from her job. The cause was that one day you were late, the day of the riot. Are your peers wealthy white men who are also business owners, downtown business owners who were perhaps affected by the riot? Those are the people who served as the grand jury for riot-related crimes. They found 128 Black Augustans guilty of burglary and attempted burglary during the 1970 uprising. The Augusta Chronicle published all of their names and addresses on the front page of the local news section. Then Governor Lester Maddox announced that the state had spent $200,000 on the riot. He called it money well spent. And if the law and order message wasn't clear enough, white business owners bought the city its own armored personnel carrier. The city sponsored a parade downtown to honor and support law enforcement. The city's Civil Service Commission promoted three officers who had policed the riot and named Captain James Beck acting chief. Chief Brodus Bequest took a leave of absence. So it's probably not surprising to hear that Lewis Dinkins was later promoted to captain, and he was named Officer of the Year. But within the Black community, his actions were a dark cloud following him. You may remember from our last episode, He was at two of the officer-involved killings during the uprising. And he also admitted to shooting a teenager, Lewis Nelson Williams, in the knees during the riot. On July 15, 1970, Dinkins and his family stopped at a traffic light on Payne College's campus. High school and college students were leaving the campus chapel after a motivational speech. As they headed back to the dorms, some of them noticed Dinkins. Hands on the wheel, windows down, family in the car. A couple of students approached Dinkins at the stoplight. We stopped for the traffic light, and there was two boys there that had just come out of the meeting, and they were there by themselves. We were, I went for the light to change, and they... One of them walked over and he put his head in the back window right by kid's face. It started all this MF, white, hulky crap. And that was unheard of then. I started to get out and get him, but I didn't have a badge or a gun, nothing. The students started running, but he caught up to one of them. But I couldn't, I couldn't hold him and keep turning him and keep my back away from this other kid. So this guy got away. Dinkins began walking back to his car. Students were still leaving the meeting at the chapel. Historian John Hayes says this is when the situation escalated. And several more members of the group that have been at the meeting are around the car. And there's an altercation. We don't know who started it. Somebody announces to the crowd that Dinkins is back. It was probably one of the worst decisions I ever made in my life. I walked down there, and it seems like there was a girl out there that had seen the incident happen, and she said, that's him, that's the white man that did that, that beat up somebody, called him by name. So 
Well, about that time, somebody hit me in the back of the head with something that knocked me down. Not out, just knocked me to my knees. People start kicking and beating Dinkins on the street. A little ways off, a Payne College security guard was watching all of this happening. So I was crawling that way with him all over my back and everything else. I crawled right into there was a guy standing in front of me. I walked, crawled right up to him, and when I looked up, he had a pistol strapped on one of these old RG-32s. I didn't know at the time, but I reached up with my left hand and pulled on the belt to pull myself up, and the belt came loose. And all of a sudden, I had it in my left hand. When Dinkins got a hold of the gun, he took off running. As I ran, I was trying to get the pistol out of the holster, and I finally did. And when I turned around, there was one guy, he was right on me, so that when I turned, the gun touched his chest, and I fired right here. But he went down. Dinkins kept firing. He hit two other people and a car that was driving by. And he went down, the guy right behind him went down. And the third guy was still coming at me, but he was trying to turn, and he had about halfway turned. And I thought about shooting him, but then I decided I didn't want to kill him, so I shot him in the leg. And uh, he, he went down, and the third guy was still coming, and I shot him in the leg. Now, that was th- three bullets. Once I started shooting, I mean, I just looked like I couldn't stop, you know. Investigators ruled that Dinkins was acting in self-defense, but three of the college students were charged with aggravated assault. One of them was Jacinto Alfonso Green. He was shot in the leg. Rodney Jason was shot in the chest. Dinkins had some bumps and bruises. He wasn't charged for this incident, but the case brought attention back to Dinkins' actions during the riot. So he and another officer eventually have their day in court. The third, like, law enforcement place is the federal courthouse where the FBI would have tried Lewis Dinkins and William Dennis. And do you you remember anything about those lawsuits? Like what those officers were charged with or anything? Mm Mm-mm. Not at all. All right, well... So Lewis Dinkins and Billy Dennis, they, they were the only two officers charged with anything related to um, people who were injured and, and killed in the riot. The Department of Justice charged then-Sergeant Dinkins and Officer Dennis with civil rights violations. Dinkins shot Lewis Nelson Williams for allegedly smashing the police cruiser's windshield. Dennis shot and killed John Stokes for allegedly looting Davis Market. According to the DOJ, both officers issued summary judgments of their victims instead of arresting them. If convicted, each could have been sentenced to one year in prison. The Georgia Peace Officer Association found this absolutely outrageous. It volunteered to pay all legal fees. WSB-TV attended its press event. The indictment of the two Augusta police officers on a civil rights violation is an affront to the thousands of Georgia law officers who daily risk their lives in the public interest. It seems that the courts are blind to the fact that police officers also have civil rights. Of the two cases, William Dennis's was the more serious. Multiple people witnessed his shooting John Stokes. Lewis Dinkins says two of those witnesses were actually in the police cruiser. He told me this story in a cafeteria. But uh, they were in the back of Dennis's car. And under arrest, and Dennis was talking to his partner, said, Hell, I know these guys. Oh, we just let them go. We we'll go. We we'll go get them some other time. And they were talking about when they when they got a call that they were looting a grocery store down on Fourth Street. As soon as they arrived at the market, Dennis started shooting. He told the FBI that someone was shooting from inside the building at him. 
But the men in the car disagreed. They didn't see or hear any gunfire coming from the store. And uh, that t- testimony on direct was, uh, yeah, they uh, they drove up in front and Dennis, without getting out of the car, started shooting at somebody inside the building with a shotgun. And no, they didn't remember any shots coming from the building. Dinkins was at his fellow officer's trial because he was working as an investigator for the defense team. They included Roy Harris, a heavyweight in Georgia politics. We heard from him earlier in the episode. The others were Torbett Ivey and Bert Hester. On uh, cross, Bert Hester was the slickest, smoothest attorney you ever saw in your life. They started out telling the same story, and before it was over, they said on the oath that, no, they didn't say a thing. thing. They said that when the shooting started, they laid down in the back seat of the car and didn't even peek out. They don't know what was going on. <laughs> William Dennis was acquitted. His lawyers were hoping Dennis's acquittal would discourage the Justice Department enough to drop the case against Dinkins. But that didn't happen. And Dinkins went to trial in February of 1971. His victim had his own charges to deal with as well. In November, police arrested Lewis Nelson Williams. The charge was aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, and his victim was Lewis Dinkins. His crime was throwing a brick at Dinkins' windshield during the riot. The charges were brought after Dinkins had been indicted in September, and months after all other riot-related cases had been processed. It's also noticeable that Lewis Nelson Williams was the DOJ's star witness. He had walked toward Dinkins. Dinkins had grabbed him, pulled him over to the patrol car. Then Williams ran away from Dinkins. Dinkins shot him helped him get into the squad car, and then drove him to the hospital. We got him in the wheelchair, but there was a black guy that was standing out there, an older man. Well, I was walking back toward the car, and he said, what happened to him? And I said, I shot him. He had plenty of chances to see Dinkins' face, his badge number, and his name. But when Williams got on the stand in February of 1971, he said he couldn't identify who shot him. Shortly after Dinkins was acquitted, Williams' assault case was postponed. And five years later, it was dropped entirely. Not many details about the Dennis and Dinkins trials were discussed in the local media. The opposite was true for the trial of Sammy Lee Parks and Lloyd Brown. These were the two teens accused of murdering Charles Oatman. Parks and Brown shared a cell with Oatman, as well as three other inmates at the Richmond County Jailhouse. In the cell next door to them was Clifford Graham. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't physically see him get beat. Did you ever walk past that cell and see him being beaten? No, not physically. I couldn't. I couldn't walk past the cell because I was in jail. Right, right. Yeah, and and and, and it's, it's like this. Then I'm ninety percent sure that what went on. You know what I'm saying? They, they beat that boy all night. Oh, don't beat me! Don't don't hit me! Oh, he was crying and all that, and then they just like I say, they hitting him. And then by being in jail, you put two and two together because you're in jail. And a strong survive. He was weak. He was a little young, weak boy. You know, he was, you know, a little free, a little boy. How many cells away from his cell do you Next door. Really? Right next door? Right next door. Mm-hmm. Parks and Brown pled not guilty. Parks even said that Brown was a quiet kid who, quote, didn't mess with anybody. Cellmates testified... Oatman was beaten daily, and he was beaten for three hours on the day he died. One witness testified that Oatman was tied in a crucifix position and beaten. They testified that once Oatman was unconscious, 
the defendants poured salt into his eyes. They also poured hot water onto his chest in an attempt to revive him. Historian John Hayes reviewed the preliminary hearing documents. He noticed significant differences between what witnesses said during the trial and what they had told the courts initially. The preliminary hearing, it's, it's pretty basic. You know, they, they beat him. They beat him with their fists, with a shoe, with a belt, um, with a stick. But then by September, you've got these lurid new details that were never in the preliminary hearing. Hayes says the reason for these changes could lie in the timeline. Oatman's autopsy was not released to the public until after the first trial in May. The injuries listed in the report couldn't be explained by their initial testimonies. The autopsy is out there by this point as it was not publicly out there by the Friday of the preliminary hearing back in May. It's out there. Everybody reading the Chronicle can read the autopsy. So four months later, for this case of the state, uh, evidence needs to match autopsy. There are just too many suspicious details there. The grand jury charged both Parks and Brown with voluntary manslaughter by mid-July. They were found guilty in September and they were both sentenced to 10 years in prison. Augusta officers are acquitted and promoted. The Oatmans don't get any recompense. On national television, the city's mayor insinuates Black Augustans are lazy. But Black people don't give up. Arthur Sims certainly didn't. He was the head of the local chapter of the SCLC, he was also a reverend in Augusta. Operation Mountaintop is what I, uh, the division the Lord gave me to establish. Sims knew dead-end jobs and poor pay were the norm for Black Augustans. So Operation Mountaintop's first initiative was to plan a boycott of Broad Street. Broad Street is the downtown's main drag, and at the time, all the businesses on it were owned by whites. And I use the membership of my church and young people, even those from Columbia County, to uh, sponsor this boycott. And it was because uh, merchants in Augusta were not hiring blacks, were not paying them fair wages, uh, and were not contributing to the broad community. And uh, I think I used the expression, uh, to hell freeze over, we were broadcast, we were boycott. Sims was able to recruit a large crowd to protest on Broad Street daily. But for many in the Black community, fear of retaliation kept them from participating. There was a fear, uh, a great fear. But but nevertheless, the bar card excelled. We started on Broad Street, and um, I remember as we participated, uh, many Blacks would pass by and bring us food, but they would not march. But to those who did, uh, God bless them. The pressure on merchants built. Enough so that the city finally stepped in. It asked the newly formed Human Relations Commission to negotiate between downtown merchants and the Operation Mountaintop leaders. Charles Walker was one of those. So the Human Relations Commission was supposed to create, was was created to bring the community together to finally have that evasive conversation of desegregation and racial hatred. We finally said, well, we're going to have this conversation. One of Operation Mountaintop's demands was that the city follow through on funding and staffing that organization. Until then, the Human Relations Commission existed in name only. They needed an executive director. And guess who they hired as the executive director? Me. (laughs) Walker and his secretary were the only staffers But they got a contract with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They were investigating discrimination. I initiated an investigation at uh, Continental Can out there. This was in 1975. They had uh, five or six hundred employees, and they they paid the blacks well. But they couldn't go anywhere but to the woodyard. They would not let the blacks work in any other department except for the woodyard. Out there with the saws and all the stuff that hurt you. So... I went out there and I was doing an investigation and by luck, I got out there and they had about 
two or three, they gave me about 3,000 applications. And that was designed to discourage me. And by accident, I discovered something. On the application in the top left-hand corner, there was one dot, or in the top right-hand corner, there were two dots. And then all of a sudden, I started looking at it. It's all these things that are dots, all of them in the same spot. So I started checking out the ones who were two dots and then one dot. Two dots were black people, minorities. And the one dot turned out to be everybody who had one dot was white. Walker continued to fight for better economic conditions for black people in Augusta. And progress was made, but it wasn't made without opposition. They would not move until we made them move. For instance, in 1972, the state of Georgia implemented statewide busing measures. White families were outraged, especially in Augusta. ABC News was there when they protested it. The rally to kick off the boycott attempt was held in Augusta, Georgia, a city where most community and school officials have openly supported previous anti-busing protests. A public school stadium was open for the rally and an estimated 5,000 people. Thousands of white parents kept their kids home from school as a show of protest. Then some of them moved to another county or sent their kids to private schools. Richmond County's superintendent retired instead of submitting to desegregation. But busing did eventually happen, and that gain helped. Students like Donna Jackson were able to attend more well-funded, traditionally white schools. I got other family members that wound up at Laney, and the disparity was just, oh my gosh, what do you mean you don't have books? What do you mean you don't know what a microscope is? There were a lot of differences. These were differences that people like Black Panther Wilbert Allen and Augusta City Councilman Grady Abrams had risked their lives to end. Allen continued to push for police and housing reform. But he says the FBI and local law enforcement had infiltrated Black Panther chapters. And basically what they did is destroy the the structure we had in Augusta. They destroyed it. And and, um, all I got was 20 years of hell. That's what I got. Um, 25 or 30 years of hell because when I got it, when I came back to Augusta, I could not, could not even work in Augusta. I couldn't even get a job in Augusta. I only got a job when I left this area for about 20-some years and worked. Activism in Augusta slowed down again. But it wasn't the only city in the nation worn out after losing a lot of Black lives and a lot of Black leaders. Some Augustans never stopped reminding white officials they would be held accountable. Grady Abrams was one of those people. In July of 1970, Abrams made a speech to the city council. Here's an actor reading an excerpt. Since the May 11 event, this administration has been fiddling. Endorsing the police department in their actions will not solve the problem. Having a big support your local police department parade does not solve the problem. In fact, all of these actions have done more to polarize the black and white community. Officials in Augusta are clothed in uniforms, invested with authority, armed with the instruments of violence and death, and conditioned to believe that they can intimidate, maim, or kill black people with the same recklessness that once motivated the slave owners. There are too many elected officials who have been quick to label every protest or demonstration by blacks against the administration of government as a communist plot to overthrow the government. The black citizens will not stand for the unjustified and arbitrary invasion of the rights guaranteed to all people under the Constitution. The fight wasn't over. And after all this effort, how much progress did Black Augustans really see? In our next episode, we look at the present day. What's happening now? How much different is it from back then? I'm C. Stachura. 
Thanks for joining us. For transcripts and multimedia, check out our website, www.gpb.org forward slash shots. And subscribe and review us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Shots in the Back is reported and hosted by me, C. Stachura. Assistant producer, Rosemary Scott. Our editor is Kiosha Howard. Additional assistance by Nefertiti Robinson and Lars Lonroth. Research support comes from Corey Rogers at the Lucy Craftlaney Museum of Black History and John Hayes at Augusta University. Supplemental equipment from Eric Kinlaw. Our theme was composed by Tony Aaron Music, additional music provided by DeWolf Music, mixing by Jesse Nicewanger. We heard archival material in this episode from WSB News Film Collection at the University of Georgia Libraries and the Vanderbilt Television News Archive, oral histories courtesy of Reese Library Special Collections at Augusta University. Sean Powers is our podcasting director, and Mary Lynn Ryan is the station's vice president of news. Gary Dennis is the executive director at Jesse Norman School of the Arts. This podcast is funded in part by a South Arts grant. <laughs>